once again, we are here at ISS NYC Job Fair. We're here with recruiters and candidates. The recruiters are just over here finishing up with all of their um, interview interview appointments. So I appreciate a uh, special guest that's coming here with me. I'll let him introduce um, himself and looks like we're color coordinated. This one yeah, we worked not. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> no, worked me and Jim up. really worked it out though. Yeah, Jim from Cayman. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> we really worked out like a match coordinator. I don't thing, see you your know? white shoes though, man. He's wearing white shoes today. So you got to work on that. the same thing. He couldn't see the no. thing. So no. I'm glad to introduce sure. you. Sure. So. Um, my name is Ted Mokrish. I'm the head of school at Canadian International School in Bangalore, India. Um, and we're late because of me. It wasn't my cues on time. Um, and so when I saw this opportunity, I thought oh, it would be interesting to kind of talk out and I, you know, kind of see Mike Brown, the ISS scene for a couple of years now. So happy to help out and to just kind of talk about what it is that you're interested in, mm -hmm. in, but I also think what a lot of schools are interested in, maybe if they don't articulate it, um, but the kind of bigger picture skills, the macro kind of ideas about um, teaching and learning and more importantly, being a part of a community. I think that's something, especially folks that are coming from the US, they're just launching for the first time or another national system and they're going overseas for the first time. When you go to an international school, you're actually going to not just the school, but a whole community. Um, and that's comprised of not only international faculty, but national faculty. A lot of people say expat and locals. Mm -hmm. We use the terms national and international faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and our principal, who's in his second year, he came from the U.S. and he said, well, I'm a national faculty member because all I know is, you know, the U.S. and New York City. And um, that's kind of what that's about. So if you are have been a part of one system, you went to K through 12 of your whole life and then college and then you teaching there. That's kind of what I look at as a national faculty member because that's your experience. Whereas when you are rubbing elbows with people from Ireland or Australia or mm -hmm. France and you're looking at different approaches or sensibilities or pedagogies, it literally changes the way that you think and plan when you feel like, oh, wow, you can do that. Like we give each other permission to do a much broader spectrum of things with kids in classrooms um but you're also moving to a new community you don't have the support structures of family and friends around you even in the digital age where you can pick up the phone mm -hmm. it's very different than being able to go over to a friend's house for dinner when you're like having a problem or something you want to just be with friends um so it's really important we really look for people that are curious, like not just, oh, I like to travel and I want to do that. Like, um, I can tell you a lot of heads, they're not really interested in being your travel agent. And so you want to go to a place and travel around for like, that's nice. I mean, people are doing that internationally, but like, what are you curious about? I just came from several interviews and I said, tell me about yourself. What do you like to do? And people launch into their, their, their CV and they tell, oh, I did this and this and this. I'm like, what do you like to do as a human being, mm -hmm. right? Because that's really important in international communities because it's that that what you really bring to the community. And how do you remain interested and interesting and curious um, for yourself? Like, what do you do to feed yourself, your soul? And also what that implies too is what do you contribute, right? Mm -hmm. Because... Um, when we feed ourselves, we feed others, right? In that sense. So I think that's really the biggest pieces for us when we're looking for people. We can teach strategies and pedagogies and ways of assessment and, and curriculum and co-teaching strategies and all that good stuff. Can't change personality. Changing assumptions and beliefs is really hard. It's like the biggest culture piece to like make those shifts or really long term so we look for people that are curious interested and like whatever they are that we have lots of different personalities and i think that's really good for a community because you want a richness and a diversity of, of attitudes and approaches to things and it's better for students like we know students do better 
in a diverse setting. We know students do better when they're in multi-level classrooms versus tracked classrooms. Mm -hmm. As much as people like to think, well, how are the high flyers going to learn? The high flyers do better in uh, multi-level classrooms than they do in a tracked situation. And that, I think, plays out across with us socially as well. Like, we do better, like if you're always around, as my friends in college used to say PLUs, like people like us, mm -hmm. if you're always around people like us, you know, and we're very polarized and tribal now. And I think that's an effect of that. Taking a step out of your comfort zone is literally to me, the definition of learning. Like, so how do you keep yourself uncomfortable? in a way that keeps you stretched and growing keep um, yourself uncomfortable. yeah you got to keep yourself uncomfortable like what are you doing like we were just talking about digital recording right. i'm a long time musician and i had never really recorded digitally and i'm going to be very uncomfortable as i get this new gear back mm -hmm. home and start trying that failing epically but that's what it's about and so on a social level on a community level that's something too where everybody comes together and we do make missteps and we do say things maybe that are not uh, uh, appropriate culturally or ethnically in that sense but then we have the people in the community to say hey you know this is how we talk about that and it's uncomfortable and hard but it's how we I think grow as people and human beings as, as a community um, so that's the kind of uh, I work I think that in terms of looking for people to join a community, that's really what we look for. People that are sincere and curious and um, want to take steps out of their comfort zone and not just like, oh, I'm moving to a new country. But it's a, it's a lot more than just geography. Yeah. So. Oh, you, 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 you put a lot in there. Um, and I just I, came, can, I can talk a little bit. No, no worries. No, <laughs> not harassment at all, actually. And something that I just wanted to point out is that it just came from the AIE conference, the leadership conference, uh, leadership conversation, rather. Right? Mm -hmm. And I felt like something that was the theme of the whole weekend was you must work on yourself before you start working on your school. And mm -hmm. I feel like everything that you're saying is that, you know, person needs to know exactly what their strengths and weaknesses are, sure. you know, before they go and run a school or run little kids even, you know, yeah. so. No, and that's a good point. And also like, what are the limits of the community? Um, you brought up AAIE and, you know, I had wanted to have conversations about what's happening in Gaza and Palestine and Israel. And it, didn't see the light of day. Like it didn't seem like the, the community was ready to talk about that right now. And it's very, very emotional, right? Emotional. And so, you know, the worst thing you can do in an emotional response or conversation is answer it with some kind of rational cognitive thing, because the first thing you have to do is get through the emotional aspects of those things. And it was just really clear it wasn't like, it's too raw, it's not time to put that on the table and have those discussions. But I think in international schools, we can have a tendency to cherry pick what we do pay attention to based on the country we're in or where we're at. And I think it's better for our community and it's better for our students when we do have, I don't even call them hard conversations anymore. I think they're necessary conversations. Right. Like we have to have those necessary conversations. We have to develop develop in the community dialectic thinking where you can be talking about something that maybe you really don't agree with or even like maybe you detest but you have to be able to talk about it cognitively in a way where you can put those ideas out on the table and we have to be able to do that for everyone um, because we don't know necessarily who's in our community where their backgrounds are where where it is how they may be stressed or a part of um, those kinds of things so thank you in a day and age of let's say technology that's ever growing ever so fast at that it's millennial i've been a part of my life where i didn't have uh, much technology and to see how it's grown to now and just last year we have a technology that was already there but advanced in such a way that <clears throat> now it's it's for the masses 
I just wanted to know in regards to your school, um, what is the infrastructure in your school that adapts, you know, any new technology? And uh, in the future, uh, what do you foresee for technology? Sure. Your school? Um, well, there's a whole bunch to that, uh, mm -hmm. Mike, like we are the first 100% solar powered school mm -hmm. in India, and we actually sell not only back to the grid, but we donate to a local school so that they have some power needs met. Um, so their budget is going to just keeping the lights on. Um, we're the first uh, Apple Distinguished School in India and the first one-to-one -one iPad school in South India. So really good, that kind of basic technology. The conversations we're having right now are about AI and the ethical use of AI. Um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, you have to be 13 to sign up, but every five-year-old's got an account. And it's the same thing with like ChatGPT. It's, you know, and, I, and I'm thinking... I want fourth and fifth graders ethically working with AI now. So when they get into middle school and then high school, like I almost feel like our high school kids, it's too late in a way to in, instill this sense of ethics with them and using it. And it's just this kind of shorthand to get stuff done quickly. But like we're looking at... Um, you know, I had a teacher just share 27 unit plans that she wrote in four hours through mm -hmm. AI. She got, mm -hmm. She's really good at it. They're about 70, 80% written. She needs to add resources and differentiation and other things. But like, instead of four hours a unit, 27 times faster. And that's amazing because time is our most precious thing, right? So using AI appropriately and ethically to help minimize the impact on our time, I think mm -hmm. is really important. The other thing that's really exciting is like AI generated textbooks is phenomenal. Like wow, when we can, can you explain that a little bit? Like so, like and it's just yeah. something we're starting to look at. And so you can create personalized textbooks for a course based on a syllabus. You can plug that stuff in and, and then say, develop resources based on this. And you could do it unit by unit. You could do, and we're just starting to play mm -hmm. with that. But even things from like a marketing point of view, we interviewed uh, a Japanese family, a French family, um, an Indian family from India, and an ethically Indian family from the United States who's at our school. And we have about five, six hours of footage, and we want to get like a two minute and 23 second video mm -hmm. from that. So going through all those shots and times, we plugged in the transcripts and said, these are the keywords. This is what we're doing. Give us 80 seconds from this family, 80 seconds from this family. And it spit out the script. And it took about three iterations to get one family done. And about four minutes, we had what we would have taken day. I was dreading this job. I was like, oh, God. I was like, I used to do documentary film work back in the day. And one of the things I used to do was sit with time code. And it is mind numbing because you have to pay attention. And it's it's horrible. So, so it really, I was like, whoa, we plugged it in in four minutes. And it was just the free version of ChatGPT. Right. Right. So, oh, so you guys I think that's the tech piece that, you know, I, I don't feel we're there, but um, we're getting there. Okay. That's good to hear. Uh, could you just speak quickly on the diversity um, or percentage or however you wish to point that out? the school uh, in regards to the teachers that are there sure um so we're we we fluctuate between you know 60 40 50 50 uh national to international faculty mm -hmm. we hire people like india is an exceptionally diverse country to begin with so north india east south india very different culturally linguistically ethnically just in terms of what's there um, and then throughout the world, one of the things we're really keen on, too, is launching national faculty out into the world, because that's really hard. I mean, maybe if you're a chemistry teacher or a math teacher of Indian nationality, that that's something that maybe you'll get a look. But like hiring an English teacher from India, that, that's hard. And there's definitely a bias about that. So we really look to how we can break that down and help support teachers launch Nash internationally as well. And then looking at it, who we have, like we just hired a woman from Kenya to come in as our IB coordinator. The, what this, what the work this woman was doing was phenomenal. And I'm like, how is nobody picking her up? And we hired a woman from Peru at the start of this year. 
um, who's amazing. She's an IB psych psychology teacher for 10 years in Peru, and she's wanted to go overseas for a long time. And um, we're looking at another um, IB psychology teacher who's Spanish, and everyone wants to hire her as a Spanish teacher, but not as a psychology teacher. And I think like that's an important thing too, that we reframe what we think someone is capable or not capable of and really look at and have those conversations that are not like, oh, I see from your resume. Like talk to them what they're curious about, talk to them about what's interesting to them, talk about those kinds of pieces. So for any candidate that may be um, two guys are prospecting right now, you know, do you have any advice for them just in case they are listening right now? Sure. To tomorrow's interview. Just be yourselves. Um, don't be who you think that the, the role wants. It's incredibly anxiety inducing. These are really rough. And I've been on both sides of the table and it is harder to be a candidate than somebody recruiting um, as much as we want to fill the roles. It's, 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 uh, it's a very anxious inducing experience and just be yourself, be, you know, try to calm yourself down and, um, you know, the right roles will appear and it's not going to be what you thought it was going to be. So just stay open-minded about that. It's never going to be, I'm going to that school and that's the only place it, like, it doesn't work like that. Uh, get your foot in the door and go to a place like we love having people come and then they want to switch roles that they're qualified for. We're very happy to do that. And I think most other schools are too. So just be yourselves. For, for our listeners, can you let us know where to find you, your website? Sure. So www.canadianinternationalschool.com. Uh, we're in Bangalore, India. Um, we have Facebook and Instagram presences. There's LinkedIn presences as well. Um, yeah. And I have, an, I guess it's X now, uh, HOS at CISP.org.in. Um, Ted Mokrish, and I also have my Facebook page for Ted Mokrish as well uh, to do that. So, yeah, reach out and say hello. Thanks a lot, Ted. Okay. And I got to get back into the throw of things. Thanks I was getting a lot. message. Somebody's waiting. For oh, okay. Me. No, that was it. So, thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Today. Thanks, everyone.